So welcome everyone. Um, we thank you for your participation. We have uh, almost 200 people registered to this event uh, about Green Bond. The EU Green Bond started as a, a game changer in the low carbon transition. Uh, we thank Finance for Tomorrow for organizing this Paris uh, for Tomorrow Week, uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about Green Bond today. There's still some people <laughs> logging in, so maybe I will wait a few seconds um, before starting. Um, so today, uh, the speakers will be uh, myself, so Marion Vincent, and the CEO of Carbon for Finance. I uh, will make the introduction to the green bond market and uh, explain uh, in a few words the new regulation. And then Jean Fontana, a senior analyst in our team, will explain in more details the methodology we apply on green bonds. And we have a pleasure to welcome uh, Gail Cunningham from Franklin Templeton Investments. Uh, one of our clients uh, with testimony on how to use our data for green bond reports. Maybe while we wait for everyone to connect, uh, I can present Carbon for Finance uh, for those who don't know us. Uh, so we are a climate and biodiversity data provider. We're part of a group Carbon 4 created in 2007 by Jean-Marie Jacovici and Alain Grandjean. Um, so Carbon 4 consulting entity have been working with corporates for more than 10 years and then we decided to export this climate expertise uh, into databases um, for financial investors. So for climate, we have two uh, offers, one on transition risk called Carbon Impact Analytics, CIA, uh, calculates the induced and avoided emissions quam scope one, two, and three, and calculate the temperature of your portfolios. Uh, we've got a second database on physical risk called CRIS, Climate Risk Impact Screening, uh, will assess the vulnerability of your portfolios towards climate hazards. And since in summer, we made another partnership with uh, CDC Biodiversity um, to uh, develop a biodiversity impact database called BIAGBS, or Biodiversity Impact Analytics, uh, using uh, the tool developed by CDC Biodiversity, the Global Biodiversity Score. So with this free database, we uh, provide accurate and more granular data to investors. We are all based in Paris. Uh, we have got an international coverage of uh, more than 120,000 instruments, and we can assess your portfolios uh, of equities, uh, bond, corporate bonds, and uh, unlisted assets as well. So let's talk to uh, the green bond market. So the market for green bonds has steadily developed over the last few years. Uh, in 2020 alone, green bonds issuance stopped close to uh, $300 billion. However, this issuance barely represents 4% of the total corporate bond issuance in 2020, while the European Commission expects green bonds to become one of the largest sorts of green, green investments as to meet the green investment gap in Europe. So until now, the green bond landscape was based on market-defined standards uh, with a possible lack of transparency, consistency, and credibility for investors. So without a proper bottom-up analysis of climate mitigation contribution also, uh, greenwashing hinders the transition to a low-carbon economy. Um, that's the bond approach that Jean will explain a bit further later. And uh, with this European new regulation for green bonds, uh, this is about to change. Carbon Fund Finance uh, has been supporting investors uh, with uh, assessing this climate impact of green bonds for years now. Uh, and with this new regulation, we hope that uh, there's going to be a, a progress on this market. Um, so green bonds will play a critical role in the decarbonization of all sectors of our economy. However, the definition of green activities remain fuzzy. Uh, and that's why uh, we needed like more comprehensive and ambitious uh, regulation and rather closer to the European taxonomy. So in July 2021, the renewed European Sustainable Finance Strategy introduced a longer waiting green bond framework called the EU GBS or European Green Bond Standards. So with the European Green Deal and its ambition to reduce our emission by 55% by 2030, uh, substantial investments are needed in all sectors to reach Europe's climate commitments. And for Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the Commission, this framework uh, will set a gold standard for how investors can recognize green bonds representing real green investments to help them make the right choice. 
So following the technical expert group's recommendation, uh, the new uh, EU green bond standard address uh, the actual greenwashing and transparency challenges. So it will be a voluntary standard for EU or non-EU issuer and, and only green projects uh, which are 100% aligned with the EU taxonomy requirements can be eligible to this new uh, standard. So um, you can see on the right side of the slide the four key requirements uh, for this new standard. So projects should be aligned first uh, with the EU taxonomy, contributing to one of the six environmental objectives, uh, complying with the DNSH principle and the minimum social safeguards, and satisfying the technical screening criteria as defined in the taxonomy. Uh, the second requirement is the full transparency uh, in the reporting of the use of proceeds. So as you can see on the bottom issuer, we need to fill in a lot of documents. So uh, the EU uh, green bond fact sheets, annual allocation reports, a post issue and review reports, an impact report with explanation on environmental impacts, and a prospectus which explicitly states the underlying objectives. The third requirement is to have external reviewers uh, to check uh, each EU green bond uh, and make sure they comply with the standards requirements. And these external reviewers uh, will be accredited by the ESMA, the European Securities and Market Authorities. So these requirements are a major step forward uh, for improving transparency in the green financing markets. And that will give um, the insurance to, pro uh, will give uh, investors some insurance uh, that they're contributing to the low carbon transition. But beside this new regulation, uh, investors will need additional quantitative measurements to make sure that they understand the green bond and their impacts. So that's why Carbon for Finance uh, developed a specific methodology on green bond inspired by uh, the carbon impact analytics methodology. Because uh, with our bottom-up approach, we quantified the induced emissions, squabs one, two, and three. But in addition, we calculate the avoided emission to make sure that investors correctly assess uh, the degree of contribution of the green bonds and to make sure that the green bond is green. So now I will let Jean explain a bit further the methodology and uh, after you will have a chance to hear Gail on how to use the data. Hello, everyone. So I will present now the methodology of carbon impact analytics uh, applied to the green bond assets. Uh, so first, you really have to understand that our methodology is a bottom-up approach so that we can have a project-by-project project, uh, assessment of climate indicators, uh, whether they are uh, climate indicators about induced and avoided emissions or overall ratings to really measure the contribution of the green bond project to climate change uh, mitigation. So I will present uh, now the several steps uh, of an analysis of a green bond to really go uh, in details in the, the way we process to, to have this bottom-up approach. So the first step is to classify the project types of the green bond financed by an issuer. Then we calculate the key indicators project by project with the bottom-up approach. Then the third step is to aggregate the results at the bond level itself. We also lead step four, the qualitative assessment on transparency uh, to assess if the issuer is really transparent about the project finance and their impact uh, in climate terms. And finally, we give uh, at the bond level an overall rating of the carbon performance of the issuance of the green bond itself. So very first step is the project type classification. As I said, uh, we want to identify the underlying projects of the green bond. What does the green bond finances? And we will classify each project in our calculation modules to lead the bottom-up approach. We have project by project of, uh, of each type of project. So uh, we have three in-scope uh, type of projects that can be uh, led uh, for which we can lead a climate analysis and other projects such as a social or governance project will be out of scope in our uh, scope of analysis. So in the first, uh, the next slide, we can see the three broad projects uh, that are um, that are given uh, for which we can give uh, climate indicators, emissions induced, avoided, uh, 
uh, other indicators, sector indicators, uh, with our CIA methodology. The very first broad sector uh, that is treated with a, a bottom-up approach is the energy sector. Uh, the coverage for energy sector is uh, renewable energy, the construction, the building of uh, renewable energy um, plants, district heating as well, and power transmission and distribution. We have a second broad uh, sector that is bottom up in our approach, the building sector, uh, whether it is construction of new buildings or refurbishment of ancient buildings. And the third um, broad uh, project that can be dealt with our methodology is the transportation mobility project uh, covering a railway projects, subway, tramway, buses also, electric vehicles and cycling path. I will go back to uh, the details uh, to see how we assess induced and avoided emissions for each broad sector. But first, in the next slide, we can see what kind of uh, indicators and climate indicators Carbon for Finance is able to provide uh, to assess uh, climate, um, climate impacts and climate contributions of the green bonds financing. The first uh, indicators we provide are, of course, uh, absolute induced and avoided emissions in the three scopes, scope one, two, and three. We can also provide an indicator, which is the CIR, a carbon impact ratio. It's really an important uh, indicator in our methodology. Uh, it consists in the ratio of total avoided emissions over total induced emissions, and it will really measure uh, to what extent the Green bond project or the green bond itself will take part in, uh, will contribute to climate change mitigation. We also provide uh, information about induced and avoided emissions intensities in terms of CO2 equivalent per million euro of financing and overrating by sector. I will present uh, the overrating a little later. In the next slide, I uh, present uh, how we compute uh, emission savings in our carbon impact ratio methodology. Um, to compute uh, emission savings, we will compare the situation of the project, um, how many uh, tons of CO2 equivalent are induced by the project financed by the green bond with a scenario. The scenario, of course, will depend on the type of the project. It's not the same if we have an energy project or a mobility project, for example. But we will compare, so the induced emission of the project with the reference scenario to know if we have or not uh, emission savings thanks to the financing of the green bond. I go now uh, in more details, uh, sector by sector, to understand how we compute induced emissions and emission savings for each broad sector I presented that are in scope in our methodology. The very first uh, broad sector, so is the energy sector. And for the energy sector, uh, our computation will depend on the transparency of the issuer. As I said, and as Marianne said, uh, the transparency is a little different from one issuer to another. And so for some issuers, we will have the megawatt capacity of the power plant financed by the green bond. In that case, we will be able uh, to transform the megawatt capacity into megawatt hour. And as we have uh, emission factors uh, in our database in ton of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour, with a simple multiplication, we will be able to know for this project and this megawatt capacity, how much ton of CO2 equivalent are induced by the project. We can also have a simplified mode to uh, assess uh, induced emissions for energy projects using the CAPEX methodology. We will know that um, the, the, the green bond will finance uh, X million euros uh, in power plants. Then we will multiply these million euros with a, an economic ratio in megawatt hour per euro to go back to ton of CO2 equivalent induced. For the energy sector, the way we compute uh, emission savings uh, is really we compare uh, the situation of the, the green bond with uh, the scenario in uh, the energy mix of the country where it was uh, settled. Now, um, you can go back to slide 15. Uh, in the broad sector of real estate and construction, the building sector, the building industry, the advanced methodology will take into account the square meters or the surface that is built or uh, refurbished. And we will compute induced emission thanks to the emission factors 
to uh, to convert these square meters into ton of CO2 equivalent induced. If the issuer does not provide enough information about the surfaces that are built or refurbished, then we will use the CAPEX simplified mode of calculation consisting in uh, converting million of euros into square meters to go back to our induced emissions. In this field, the emission savings calculation will depend on the quality of the project. Is it a construction project or a refurbishment project? For construction projects, the idea is to say that the building that is built uh, by uh, the Green Bond will replace a certain percentage of the existing buildings. So that, uh, as these uh, new built uh, buildings are more efficient than the existing ones, then we have emission savings. If the project finances uh, refurbishment, the idea is to say the refurbishment of an ancient building will enable this building to consume less energy and so to be less intensive. This leads to uh, emission savings. The third uh, broad sector that is taken into account in our methodology uh, is the uh, transportation sector. For transportation sector, we do not have an advanced uh, methodology. So here it is an example. We can take this example uh, as a case study. Uh, we don't have the advanced methodology to compute induced emissions. We only have simplified mode of calculation of induced emissions for the transportation sector. Here, the case study is about uh, the emission of Société du Grand Paris uh, to build, of course, uh, new, uh, new lines of transportation in the, the Ile-de-France region, the Ile-de-France area. And so we have the, um, the amount invested in, uh, the green, by the Green Bond in these projects. 1,750 million euros, and we will compute these emissions thanks to, uh, to an economic ratio to go back to the center kilometer. And thanks to our emission factors, we are able to convert this investment in ton of CO2 equivalent induced. Here we can see we have nearly 300,000 ton of CO2 equivalent induced scope one, two, and three upstream. In, consisting in uh, the construction of the railway. For emission saving calculations, we here again uh, discriminate uh, the newly built uh, projects and the refurbishment of ancient projects. Here, for example, the new transport line, the idea will be to say, as we build a, build a new transport line, uh, some people that used to, for example, take uh, their car to go to work will use this new transport line uh, instead so that they will uh, save emissions uh, in this field. The idea for renovation is the same uh, as a, for the building sector. We will say that if we renovate a, a means of transportation, uh, these uh, renovation, this refurbishment will, of course, make the transport line uh, more efficient so that it will save emissions. Here, for example, for uh, Société du Grand Paris uh, issuance of green bond, we have nearly 250,000 tons of CO2 equivalent saved. Uh, and so all the calculation done, we can see that we have a carbon impact ratio of 0.85 which is not a bad score, it's a, a good score, um, the score of 0 0.85. It means that for each ton of CO2 induced by the project financed by Société du Grand Paris, we have 0 0.85 ton of CO2 saved by this project. So now that I uh, presented the details of uh, the calculation of induced and saved emissions for each sector, uh, we have, you have to understand that we will reprocess these emissions, these calculated emissions twice. The first uh, reprocess of emissions will consist in answering the question to what extent does the money of the green bond takes part in the financing of the project. For example, if the green bond finances 10% of uh, the entire cost of a power plant, then we will allocate only 10% of emissions of the project to the green bond. The second allocation and reprocessment of emissions will consist in uh, answering to the question, to what extent does the issuer take part uh, in the building of the project? 
Typically, if a bank uh, issues um, a green bond, it will not have the same place in the supply chain than uh, the builder itself of the green bond. And so we reallocate emissions uh, to this bank or to this construction uh, constructor, depending on their, um, on their place in the, in the supply chain. So now that you know how we compute induced and saved emissions for each project, uh, I remind you that we have a bottom-up approach for each kind of project, then we also compute an overall score. This overall score, it, uh, project by project, <clears throat> depends on uh, our calculation. For example, the carbon impact ratio, which is the ratio of emission savings over induced emissions, will be um, a source to understand the overall rating of the project itself. We have also other sectoral criteria. For example, for the renewable projects, we have the emission factor of the, of the project and compare it with scenarios to give an overall score uh, from A to E, from 1 to 15. So this is the way we compute all these indicators project by project, induced emissions, avoided emissions, uh, CIR and uh, over rating. Now we need, of course, to aggregate these results um, and to see this aggregation in the bond level, in the entire bond level. <clears throat> and so it is the third step of analysis, uh, CIA analysis of a green bond. We need to aggregate the results. And so uh, at the bond level, we will first aggregate the results of the emissions induced and avoided, doing a sum of all the emissions of all the projects finance. As the projects um, uh, emissions are retreated uh, and reprocessed emissions, we can do the simple sum of all these emissions so that we have the emissions of the green bond itself. We also provide a qualitative assessment on the transparency of the issuer of the green bond. Um, that's the, the next slide. And the fourth, um, fourth step of analysis uh, of the green bond. Uh, the qualitative assessment on transparencies consists in assessing uh, whether the issuer uh, gives a lot of details about the issuance of the green bond and the impact report of the green bond. And if it is the case, it has, of course, the best score of one out of five. It means that it provides a lot of information which enable uh, the analysts uh, in Carbon for Finance to really assess uh, in a rigorous way um, the impact of this green bond. On the other hand, you can have an issuer that does not provide any information uh, for example, uh, no uh, impact report. In that case, we, it, it will be uh, granted the, the score of five out of five, the worst score uh, in, uh, in our methodology of calculation. We have a quantitative score uh, of induced and avoided emissions. We have a qualitative assessment on transparency of the issuer of the green bond. Now we can aggregate the overall rating. Um, if it is the fifth and last uh, step in our methodology, CIA methodology, the over rating of the carbon performance. So here you can see the over rating is an overall rating of A, which means that we have an insurance that is really good. And so um, the over rating is a weighted average of all the overall ratings of all the projects financed by the green bond. Um, and so we can have an overall rating, which is the quantitative assessment of the, the impact of the green bond. We have the transparency score. Here we have a plus, which means that the issuer is uh, quite transparent about the issuance of green bond, uh, which are the, the main indicators we provide in, uh, in the level of the green bond. So now that I presented the methodology, I can present a case study. Uh, a case study that is a green bond issued by European Investment Bank. Uh, here we can see that this green bond has a maturity um, in 2029, for example. We have the ICIN of this green bond, and we know that the uh, allocation amount of green bond is of uh, nearly 900 million euros. Um, and so the very first step is the user proceed. We know in the impact reports that we have typically 25 projects. 
from project one to project five, 25, sorry, we will need to allocate this project to our scope of calculation, in scope and out of scope calculation. Here, for example, uh, project one, uh, we finance a renewable energy plant, uh, whether where project 24 and 25 will finance construction projects. That is really the very first step of analysis um, in our methodology. Now that we know uh, where to compute the emissions, we can compute project by project the emissions uh, induced and avoided, and then we can aggregate these results uh, it is the third column, third aggregation, portfolio aggregation, third step. We have the entire induced emissions, 75,000 uh, ton of CO2 equivalent. We have also emission savings, um, minus 55,000 ton of CO2 equivalents are saved by the green bond, or the entire green bond itself. And we can also provide information about the distribution of um, the distribution of impacts. For example, here we can see. So sorry for for the colors that are not very clear, but uh, we can see that um, seventy two percent of induced emissions are linked uh, to transportation projects. I think uh, they represent nearly forty percent of uh, saved emissions. On the other hand, we have uh, in dark blue ten percent of induced emissions of the green bond uh, that uh, accounts for, I think, uh, uh, renewable energy projects, and seven um, more than sixty percent of the green bond uh, of uh, emission savings. We also have, of course, the carbon impact ratio zero point seventy two, which means that the green bond uh, rather contributes to climate change mitigation. Um, we have intensities, induced intensities and avoided intensity. Then we lead the transparency score, qualitative assessment about the transparency of uh, the issuer. Here it's uh, rather good with a plus, um, which means that it provides a lot of information. And last step, the calculation of overall green bond rating. Here we have a score of 4 out of 15, which means that it highly contributes to climate change mitigation. This wind bond that was um, issued by European Investment Bank. So really the main, uh, the, the main information here about the methodology is the fact that we can provide a um, computation of, uh, of uh, impact of green bonds, both in the project level and at the green bond level. As a, as a whole. And now, Gail, it's your turn. Thanks. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Marie-Anne. Um, we, I'm going to focus on um, the way that we use the data. Um, we, obviously, the, this is a, it's a green bond fund, and um, our objective was to produce an impact report and. Um, we definitely wanted to walk away with a lot of lessons and and actually um, produce a, a very granular understanding of the data rather than just producing an impact report that would be a marketing document. Um, so what we really wanted to do was um, formulate our objectives around accountability and transparency um, and producing an overall better understanding of how impact reporting is a useful tool in assessing the role that we can play in the fight against climate change. Um, for our report, really that, that we, we set out to answer the question of which green bonds are actually the green, greenest? Or phrased another way, um, when is a green bond really green? Or when is a green bond not green at all? So having reviewed many reports of green bond funds, often um, the reports are presented as a marketing exercise and the opportunity to learn and understand what makes a really good um, green bond framework or sustainability linked bond framework is missed. Um, so we didn't want to miss that opportunity. So putting our objectives as um, accountability and transparency, we knew we needed full insight into the green bond, um, into you know full background into what the real world effect of that, whatever the induced emissions were, um, as well as the reduced emissions. Um, and then the, the, the combined um, sum total of that, what is actually the effect on climate change. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. 
Um, so in order to achieve these objectives, um, we stated that our aims, um, of our outcomes, we wanted them to be forensic and practical. And we didn't just pick those words lightly. We really thought um, quite long and hard about um, the fact that we needed forensic and practical to go together. Um, we wanted very specific detail. We wanted to know everything that happened in the entire Green Bond project. And what we wanted to know what effect of everything that happened, what effect there would be on, on climate change. So obviously for the forensic side of the project, we turned to Carbon for Finance because we wanted a methodology that would give us that insight into the construction and the development phase, taking all of those impacts and then comparing the emissions reduced with the emissions induced. And then for the practical part, um, we knew we needed insight into, you know, the real real life effects of that entire green bond. So, you know, not only um, the actual numbers, but you know, how was the product? How was the project conducted? Where it was located? Um, how it was carried out? Um, how are those things actually contributing to reducing carbon emissions and therefore having a positive effect on climate change? Um, so, for that second part, the practical part, we turned to um, a data agency called Cicero Shades of Green. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So the way we approached this report was to focus on, um, as I've said, the real life practical questions. We wanted to be able to improve our analysis frameworks in the future. So when we receive a green bond um, proposal in our inboxes from um, the sell side banks, we want to be able to look at it and know, you know, is that going to is there going to be a lot of impact? Um, are there any red flags? We wanted to be able to ask those questions at the bond roadshow stage when we've got an opportunity sitting in front of um, the issuers to actually present to them the most pertinent questions. We wanted to be able to see a, a, what, what red flags were um, in any framework. Was there any data that was left out? So these questions were really quite well considered. So, you know, what type of project Yield, typically yield the most impact? This is one of the big questions that we wanted an answer to. And using the carbon impact ratio model allowed us to recognize that some projects actually emit more carbon than they prevent from being emitted. Um, can a project be managed so badly that any potential impact is eroded? The only way that we could really do this was by drilling down into the construction phase. And as we know, this is where all the emissions can often be. If it's, say, in particular, um, a construction, a building construction, we know that steel, cement, aluminium, that, that inherently is where most of the carbon emissions would come from. But we don't often see insight into that, um, into the sourcing of those things in the Green Bond framework. Um, and that obviously leads me to, to my next question. Um, what are the red flags in a Green Bond framework? Um, typically, you know, we would look at lack of transparency or lack of information as as a red flag that the issuer hasn't actually thought about those particular things yet. And then the last question we wanted an answer to was, you know, when what is a good sustainability link bond or a good green bond framework actually look like? And what level of, level of information is there? Or what level of information do we need? In order to, um, the, the way in which carbon poor finance data helped us to answer these questions, um, the elements that we, we, we relied on most heavily was data quality, data consistency, um, the methodologies that um, Jean produced, and the transparency and compar comparability of the carbon impact ratio. If we've got um, if a project from the building sector that we need to compare, that we, if we've got the opportunity, opportunity to invest further in a project in the building sector or in a project from the energy sector, it's a very difficult um, situation to actually compare the two of those. But if we've got a carbon impact ratio, then obviously the comparability is, um, is far easier. And then um, what we also leveraged, leveraged the data for was to actually draw out best practice learnings um, from issuers and in, for, for issuers and investors. And so we can go on to the next slide. So the sector specific lessons from our analysis, what we actually learned. Um, so starting with energy, so we found the, the highest carbon impact ratio that we found from our portfolio came from a renewables project and well, an energy um, project that focused mostly on renewables. Um, we found for some of the best projects that for every ton spent on renewables development, more than 10 tons are avoided from being um, 
more than more than 10 tons are reduced. Um, that's a pretty good carbon impact ratio. Um, and we think, but judging on that number, the importance of establishing new renewable capacity just can't be overemphasized. And that really is a lesson that we've taken through to our framework and, and our analysis. We will always, um, you know, where, where, where feasible and where financially feasible, especially, we will try and prioritize um, projects that um, establish new renew renewable capacity. And then moving on to buildings. Um, Construction obviously is a very, very highly intensive, um, in, energy intensive sector. Um, I think we fully appreciated the, um, just how energy intensive it was when we looked at some of the um, numbers that came out of the construction phase for some of the projects that we invested in. Renovating old buildings um, issues less emissions than building new green buildings. And then, and partly this is due to most of the emissions being embedded in the construction phase. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, steel, aluminium, cement, those are sectors that haven't really been decarbonized. So even if the building, even if the way in which it is built and, you know, the, up to the strictest ISO standards, essentially in most um, situations, we are still dealing with in, um, input materials that are still highly carbon intensive. So even though the process and the standards are high, we know that the materials are still, they still bring with it those, um, those carbon emissions. So the conclusion from that is that using existing infrastructure is extremely efficient. If we can maintain or reuse existing infrastructure, then that would always be a preference. Um, just in, essentially keeping the emissions down um, and therefore refurbishment is, is something that in terms of thinking about this carbon budget, if we've only got a very finite amount of carbon that we can spend, we should always uh, prioritize refurbishment of buildings. And then moving on to transport. Um, Obviously, transport still responsible for nearly a quarter of direct emissions. Um, our, our taking away from that is that mass, low carbon, scalable transport is probably the most sustainable use of funds in the transport sector. We financed a number of um, green bonds where funds went towards electric vehicles. And while the emission savings, once the electric vehicle is established and on the road, is significant, um, we were, I wouldn't say shocked, I think it's a well-known fact that um, the materials in electric vehicles are highly, highly carbon intensive. Um, but the, another aspect, aspect that we gained a renewed appreciation for is that the lifespan of the vehicle is of critical importance in order to, um, long-lasting electric vehicles, we, we, need, we need electric vehicles to be long-lasting because it really ensures that the payback period for carbon emissions is achievable. So our two biggest lessons that um, we took away from the transport sector was that we, at that bond roadshow stage, we need to be asking about the lifespan of the vehicle. Um, many of the ones that we see on the road today are between eight and 10, they, they aim for between eight and 10 years. And you know, if we can push that out to between 12 and 14 years, provided that the battery lasts, you know, essentially we are dividing that induced emissions by almost 50% longer. Um, and then the second um, aspect that we must almost pay must always pay attention to is the sourcing. But this is not is nothing new. Um, we know that battery components can be recycled. We want information at the bond roadshow stage around that recycling plan. Um, mineral recycling is a huge carbon emission savings um, in terms of in terms of electric vehicles. Um, and then, you know, just to comment on on rail transport again, we know the induced emissions are really high, but once again, in instances where infrastructure is already set up, that obviously is a that plays a big part in keeping the emissions down. Um, with the example that um, Jean mentioned, we know that there are a number of stations that are being repurposed, so that that is being observed in that example. Um, I think that, oh, we've got one more slide, if we can go on to the last slide. Um, so really to come, this is the, um, almost the summary of, the, of what we learned um, in terms of the data that we used. We, we really wanted to do things differently and, and gain a very um, granular insight into um, the induced emissions of, of the bonds that we invested in. So, um, what we left with is a bunch of lessons and, and how do we now use that info? Um, we really have got to ensure that we're asking for the right data early enough. Um, I've mentioned a few times at the bond roadshow stage, if 
if you're in a if you're in a room with a bunch of ESG investors and they aren't asking ESG or emissions related questions, then it's likely that um, some of the data is going to be missed. Um, we need to be very clear about the metrics that we want. Um, you know, kilowatts per hour emissions reduction. Um, there's a whole host of different metrics that an issuer can commit to or not. Um, sometimes if we are if we know that we're going to be aggregating and reporting at a at a portfolio level then we would know those metrics in advance um and also we just need to be aware that some green bonds will be issued for reputational effect and therefore we need to have a very high standard of what we expect from issuers um i think most esg analysts have experienced um framework or have read frameworks where there's more of a sense that it's an operational improvement as opposed to a real step change um, in the strategy of the issuer. And that's something that that does come up uh, time and time again. Um, so yeah, our, our, our conclusion is that in order to contribute to a healthy green bond market, we really have to, as um, investors, be demanding high standards from issuers and also just being very transparent and open with issuers around um, what our expectations are, what our metrics, the metrics that we require and um, the targets that we think are, are genuinely stretching. Um, and we found that um, using, having insight into induced emissions and especially being able to compare, to compare that to reduced emissions um, helped us to create that common metric that we could um, use in those conversations with issuers. That brings me to the end of my slides. Well, thank you. Um, thank you a lot, uh, Gail, for your testimony. I think uh, you're right. Uh, the big challenge is to um, uh, to have like accurate data. And uh, when you're uh, an investor and you have like different uh, green bond framework or use of proceeds and you have avoided emission and you can't compute them uh, at portfolio level because they are coming from different uh, methodology and it's inconsistent number. Uh, that's where it's very useful to have a, a consistency across uh, the methodology and the metrics. I think there's a, a couple of questions and um, there's some of them already uh, used, but uh, in terms of transparency, uh, we are always very transparent with our client with the reference scenario we use for each type of project. Um, there are like, uh, like market-based scenario, either from uh, uh, the International Agency of Energy for the sector, but we, we can very be, uh, you, you can find that in our uh, methodological papers, uh, the type of scenario we use. Uh, I think the, um, the great value is that we use the same scenario and we recalculate all the induced and avoided emission for each project, meaning that if you want to aggregate or compare uh, two green bonds coming from different issuers, if it's a bank issuer or if it's a corporate issuer, you will always be able to, to have like a granular information at project level and you can compare uh, these, two, uh, these two projects. Um, I think there was some question about uh, if a project is used by a bank. Uh, as Jean said, we don't link the green bond to the issuer emissions or issuer rating. We uh, we recalculate everything based on the operational data. So what's exactly the project is financing. So for us, it doesn't matter who is the issuer. Uh, it's just at the end, we look at what it's uh, supportive in terms of um, of projects. Uh, in this analysis, we look at uh, climate projects. Uh, of course, and if there is like some part of a project financial, some uh, social issues, uh, we don't uh, review them. Uh, it will be part of out of scope analysis and this scope will be uh, linked to the issuer issuance at that stage. But otherwise, uh, we cover in the gran very granular way all the project financed by, uh, by the bond. In terms of who's paying the, the analysis, so we are an independent entity, so we uh, give an independent rating based on the physical uh, capabilities of a project. Um, so, and then we we sell the data to investors who want to invest. And if uh, the, um, the green bond report is not ready yet because the bond has just been issued, or if you are in a due diligence project phase where you want to invest, but you need very short time, we can do the analysis based on like a simplified approach uh, based on the use of process of the type of project you want to invest in. And we can uh, give you some indication of uh, if a project is uh, green or not green and uh, give you some indicative metrics. Um, well, there's a lot of questions, I'm not sure. Um, if there, 
uh, we reassess uh, the, um, the rating and the metrics of the bond uh, as long as the, 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 all the insurance is thrown or not. So if there is a remaining uh, euros not financed by the bond yet, we will always every year reassess the, the green bond to make sure that we've got the most accurate uh, allocation of, uh, of the funds to, uh, to which projects. Um, I think there was a question about her, but uh, Gail, maybe you, you wanted to, uh, to answer that. Uh, how can market participants contribute to improve the availability of data in the markets? Sure, yeah. And um, the, another one on identifying false green bonds that I can take afterwards. Um, we, you know, the contributing to improving the availability of data is... Um, it, it's not a science. It really is just about having conversation after after conversation with issuers and with investors where possible. Um, typically, the process where um, a sell side bank is working with um, issuers in order to structure a green bond, um, you know, we we aren't going to have insight until the email lands in our inbox um, and we assess a green bond framework that's already produced and it's it's finalized. So. We go and contact all the banks and we have early conversations around what our expectations are, you know, be they corporate issuers or sovereign issuers. And we tell them what our framework is. Our, our framework is not um, not kind of secret. We it, we think it's best it's best that they can see it because we may as well tell them what um, points or what aspects we are judging them on. Um, things like from a sovereign point of view, if the um, a, if a small green bond issuance is funding, um, say, renewable energy, but the rest of the country's budget is going towards propping up fossil fuels, then it's like, you know, it's a, a fish trying to swim upstream. And we think that it's going to be a drop in the ocean that's not going to make any impact. So we will make that assessment and we'll say that if the country is propping up the fossil fuel industry, but then they're trying to issue a green bond, then it's, it's not really something that we'd be interested in financing. So it's just about having open levels of communication, which is just meeting after meeting after meeting, being very clear about what our, our views are and how we will assess that green bond. Um, and then just on the false green bonds, I mean, I would say the um, the one that would stick out would be, um, and not, not to name any um, companies, but an energy um, company, if, if we believe that the target operating model, model for energy companies um, shouldn't include gas, then um, you could argue that if an energy company did issue a green bond and the majority of the funding was for um, upkeep of their transmission and general and the up up upkeep of their tra transmission pathways, then you know they could have instead put that towards generating new renewable capacity. So we um, our feedback was that that that's not good enough and we wouldn't participate in that. So it really just is about buying into what the end goal is and um, demanding a, a level of ambition. If you're an energy company, you've got you know, unlimited scope to, to, to um, build new generation capacity. Thank you, Gail. Um, I think there's a question, but uh, I think we can both reply. Um, how do you may, how do you identify four screen bond? Um, because we recalculate the scope one and scope three emission induced and avoided. For us, we challenge uh, what its return in the green bond framework or the use of proceeds of uh, of the issuer, because we will have a full assessment of the value chain of a of a project and. Um, if there is very high portion of induced emission, but very low portion of avoided emission and the famous carbon impact ratio is low or non-existent for us, it's not a green bond because the carbon impact ratio is there to measure uh, your contribution to the transition. And uh, if, uh, if there is like this carbon impact ratio is very low, uh, even close to zero for us, it's not a green bond because it doesn't have any positive impact on the transition. I don't know, uh, Gail, if you want to complete, because um, that maybe that's how you use uh, the indicator to select your projects. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, the the when we look at the carbon impact ratio, the, um, the question of longevity of the asset really becomes more clear because we, you know, often we can say that gas can be a transition fuel, but building a new gas plant is there obviously is going to be a lot of induced emissions there. So 
it helps us to having that carbon impact ratio helps us to make decisions around you know could we invest in this in short term um say upkeep of a gas plant where fundamentally it's already built and there's only a small amount of additional investment required in order to make it more efficient versus investing in a gas plant from scratch from you know from from nothing because the induced emissions for that would take you know upwards of 20 years in order to um to justify so um, from that point of view, you know, understanding if a green bond is false or not, we definitely rely on the carbon impact ratio. Um, so maybe Jean, this one is for you. And how do we get operational data from the issuers? Um, so I think the technical uh, aspect of a green bond is already uh, in their reports. Yes, the the operation uh, the operation data comes from typically the impact reports. Uh, that are public, uh, publicly available uh, and for green bonds that are uh, less than one year we use the framework the green bond framework to know which projects are financed and to allocate the projects uh, in a statistical way uh, so these are the two main sources of information for operational or uh, financial data from the issuers I think there are some uh, there is a lot can be done in the issuing process what actions outside of this ordinary market environment uh, is there any opportunity to contribute to better data more transparency a better flow of information thank you I can take that one. I think um, really just about that communication element that I mentioned. Um, you know, often in the ESG space, um, we tend to have a very high expectation of engagement and what engagement needs to look like. Um, I've got a very um, firm view that engagement is just regular talking and communication. And if that means that, um, you know, we can send out a questionnaire to the investors that we deal with or you know, even a, a quick online survey, anything that facilitates the flow of information is useful. And it doesn't have to be sitting in a bond roadshow. It can, it can be, um, you know, a, a casual conversation with a green debt team to understand, um, you know, the, the role that they play in um, helping their clients to structure green bonds. You know, do they have a different process for green loans than they do for green bonds? And if we can understand their process better, then we can understand that, um, you know, giving our input at a certain part of that process or, you know, sending them a rating, if we're going to, if we could potentially give them um, a rating for green hydrogen or for biomass or for blue hydrogen, if we could, you know, almost assign it some sort of environmental rating, we could actually, you know, give them a very, very clear yes or no um, answer with regards to what is the absolute best kind of fuel that we would never say no to. It, it really just is about certainty. Investors always can act on certainty. And, you know, if, if um, say, um, Drax knows that if they had to um, transfer away from or diversify away from uh, biomass to renewables, that investors would jump at the opportunity to invest in that green bond, then they may be more likely to come to market with that green bond. So, you know, nothing it doesn't doesn't serve us to keep anything a secret from issuers. We let them know what we like and let them know what we'll invest in and keep those communication lines open. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Gail. Thanks for your testimony and participation to this webinar. Uh, thank you for having thank me. You all. Yeah, thank you all for participating. And um, we will uh, send the slides and the replay on our website in uh, the coming days. And uh, if you want, you have any question or additional questions, or if you need to, uh, to organize a call, uh, here are the coordinates if you want to, uh, to reach us.
Thank you and have a lovely weekend. Thank you all. Bye.